and what families go through as they wait for their asylum petitions to be processed in the United States. Plus, securing voter rights. We catch up with the Arizona Secretary of State less than one year from Election Day to see what she's doing to ensure every vote counts. And we can notify that municipality to go ahead with closing a particular road or getting people out of a particular area. And flooding fears. As severe weather sweeps into the valley, we'll tell you what you need to know to keep you and your family safe on the wet roads this week. Cronkite News starts now. Before we get started, a quick announcement. We're interrupting the live coverage of the impeachment proceedings in order to bring you local news. We're carrying the live proceedings online at azpbs.org. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Daria Yasmin. And I'm Madison LaBerge. Our big story tonight, migrant families seeking shelter at the southern border. Between October 2018 and September of 2019, Customs and Border Protection has seen an almost 350% increase in families being detained there. In the past, it's been mostly single men attempting to make the trek, but now most of those trying to cross the mothers are mothers, fathers, and children. So we wanted to know what motivates them to make the dangerous and often deadly journey into the U.S. Reporter Marcella Bayeto traveled to Tijuana, Mexico, a border town that's become an unexpected host city for many of these families. Marcella? These families are now following what the Department of Homeland Security calls the Migrant Protection Por Protocols. They're more commonly known as the Remain in Mexico program, a U.S. immigration policy change now requiring migrants seeking asylum to wait in Mexico while their case is processed. According to DHS, this policy was put in place to reduce the number of those taking advantage of the immigration system while ensuring protections for population it deems as vulnerable. Now we headed to Tijuana, Mexico to see how this policy is forcing thousands of families into a state of uncertainty that is taking its toll. Because of safety and security concerns on their behalf, Cronkite News is not showing their faces or using their names. Yo soy de Guatemala. De Ecuador. De Honduras. One by one, the children remember where they're fleeing from. This migrant shelter in Tijuana is the Madre Asunta Institute, run by Catholic nuns. Here, they get a place to sleep, food, childcare, and a safe location to remain in as they go through the lengthy legal process of petitioning for asylum in the United States. Many of those here say they are fleeing their home countries because of violence, extreme poverty, and abuse. Sunny in my face. Más por mi hijo. Si yo estuviera sola, no me importa lo que me hagan, pero yo sí necesito protegerle a mi hijo. Livia is from Ecuador. She says she left her home country with her eight-year-old son due to religious persecution. Me pegaron. Yo estaba embarazada. Perdí a mi hijo que estuve embarazada. With a year's worth of savings and travel plans arranged, Livia and her son began the dangerous journey of making their way into the United States. After weeks of traveling, Livia says they arrived near the San Luis port of entry and decided to cross. Agarré a mi hijo. Digo, vamos. Hoy nos vamos al otro lado. But any hope they had of making it to the other side quickly disappeared. They were apprehended by Border Patrol and deported back to Mexico. Livia says they didn't know of the recent changes made in U.S. immigration policy regarding asylum. And she's not alone. Many of the women in the shelter telling Cronkite News they never heard of the changes before leaving their home countries, ending up in a place like Madre Asunta. This is one of the dormitories that women and their children sleep in. And according to one of the coordinators, there's around 90 people sleeping staying here at this shelter right now. The shelter's capacity is just 45 beds, but there have been up to 150 women and children staying here at any given time. Todo es de manera gratuita, no tiene ningún costo. Y el tiempo que se pueden quedar aquí es varía. Tengo 17 días, me han tratado muy bien, se me dan las tres comidas, um, habitación para dormir y ropa y calzado si necesitamos. The shelter is made up of a series of buildings connected via stairs and passageways. Stacks of clothes, suitcases, and supplies go from floor to ceiling, while each woman has a daily assigned chore. <laughs> Dinner time usually consists of donated food. On this night, bean and bread sandwiches were served. 
The courtyard turns into a makeshift playground while still wet hand washed clothes cover most of the railings. While at the shelter, Sister Limas says the women also get access to lawyers, psychologists and social workers to help them process their emotional trauma and navigate a complicated immigration legal process. Cada vez que las mujeres van a corte y son regresadas, su autoestima, su, su salud emocional, su salud mental, toda llega así como que por los suelos. Aside from the physical border wall, Lima says there is an even harder barrier to overcome for those who have never been in a situation like these women and children. No importa que se coloquen muchos muros, no importa que se coloquen muchas guardias nacionales, muchas paredes, los migrantes que ahorita están en esta frontera, al muro que más difícil que se están enfrentando es al muro de la indiferencia y de la invisibilidad. Desde que la primera vez me pegaron, él no está estudiando. Eso pensaba, decía, si puedo irme a otro país, mi hijo va a poder estudiar. Knowing what she knows now, Livia says she never would have left Ecuador risking it all. Digo, ¿por qué tuve que hacer esto? Y viene, me arrepiento que por qué me vine. While these families wait, the Trump administration is adding more asylum regulations and changes. Right now, they're looking at a new rule which would have migrants crossing through Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras first claim asylum in one of those countries before being able to seek asylum in the U.S. Now, this is in addition to the already existing Remain in Mexico program and another policy that makes immigrants ineligible for asylum if they did not claim asylum in any of the countries they passed while on their way to the U.S. In the studio, Marcel Baero, Cronkite News. And while thousands of families wait along the border, one local organization in Phoenix is denouncing the practice of separating children from their mothers and fathers. Earlier today, Ellie Nakamoto White was in downtown Phoenix. She tells us why they decided to protest. Ellie? As the exact number of separated children remains in dispute between local activists and government officials, one local group says one child taken from their parents is one child too many. It is just nightmarish to think that we would place children in that kind of danger. The kind of danger Roberto Ravelas is talking about is the one he says thousands of migrant children are facing after being separated from their families as they try to cross the United States-Mexico border. These people need our help, and so we will not rest until something changes. It has to stop. Lum and Ravelas were part of a rally taking place today in front of the Capitol in Phoenix. The demonstration put together by the Uncage and Reunite Families Coalition, a grassroots organization whose mission is to promote and work towards reunifying migrant children and their families. The group choosing to protest today in honor of World Children's Day, designated by the United Nations and commemorated every November 20th. And that's why we're here, rain or shine, on November 20. This is the day of the child, and it's time to step up for our children. They're treated inhumanely. So when you destroy families, you're destroying a country. According to the group, thousands of migrant children were detained in 2019. To defend innocent children who are being separated from the love of parents who were seeking refuge in this country that has traditionally been a country welcoming of people in need. Cronkite News reached out to the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the one that oversees migrant children once they've been separated from their family. But as of this broadcast, we are still in the process of confirming with them what their policies are. Live at the Digital Desk, Ellie Nakamoto-White, Cronkite News. Jury deliberations are set to begin in the case against border aid worker Scott Warren. In closing arguments earlier today, his defense lawyer said Warren only provided humanitarian aid to two Central American men who crossed the border illegally in January 2018. But federal prosecutors argued Warren actually hid the men for four days, then gave them directions to skirt a nearby checkpoint, solely to help them evade capture by Border Patrol. Our other big story today, wintry weather slamming the state. This is a live look from Snowbowl, north of Flagstaff. 
the ski area ready to welcome its first visitors this Saturday. According to the National Weather Service, the rain much of Arizona is getting this week will change into wintry mix down to 6,500 feet and snow will accumulate above 7,000 feet. Back here in the valley, three elementary schools in Glendale closing for the day due to power outages caused by the severe weather. And the rain isn't going away anytime soon. Well, flash flood watches will continue into the evening with back to back storm systems expected to top all of monsoon 2019 when it comes to rain totals. Cronkite News reporter Jordan Evans joins us live from downtown Phoenix. Jordan, I see you have your umbrella in hand. Is it still raining out there? Not currently raining at the moment. You know, the theme the rest of the afternoon has just kind of been off and on. We got a little bit of a shower about 10 minutes ago, and then we actually just got a really big gust of wind up here. We had to secure our camera here for a second, but that's going to be the theme. I think for the next couple of hours, Daniel Malkin will bring you your full forecast here in just a minute, but I want to show you a video from earlier today. This was the scene from the I-17 in Greenway in North Phoenix. Cars driving through what appears to be about one foot of water, which even caused some of those vehicles to stall. Police had to close this intersection temporarily, too, until the water receded. As much as two inches fell in parts of the North Valley today. So I sat down with the Flood Control District of Maricopa County for their advice to see how to stay safe on the roads. Don't drive through flooded washes. Uh, if you see water, turn around, don't drown. You hear that slogan. But the point behind it is most of our flooding here happens quickly and it ends very quickly. So it's not worth risking your life for having to find an alternate route or waiting maybe 30 minutes till the water recedes. It doesn't rain a lot here when it does, um, though it can be high impact. It, it happens quick. Um, and so just people being alert, being weather aware, being flood smart. So as you saw in that video earlier, that is just an imperfect, that is just the perfect example of what not to do uh, when you encounter a flooded roadway. Remember, you'll want to turn around, don't drown, do not put yourself uh, in that dangerous situation for putting yourself as well as other uh, people in danger. But let's switch gears now to Daniel Malkin there in the Cronkite News Weather Center. And Danielle, my hair was not looking too great this morning thanks to all this extra humidity. When can we expect these skies to clear out? Well, Jordan, the reason you are expecting one of our not so perfect hair days is because of our dew point and all of the humidity and the moisture that is in the air. So right now our dew point in Phoenix is 57 right, okay. degrees. And when we come when we combine that with our temperature moderating just around the 60 degree point right now, we get all of that moisture in the air. So that's why we're feeling something we don't feel quite often here in Arizona, and that's humidity. But by the end of the week, it should be out of our way. How much rainfall did we observe here in Arizona today? New River, they take the cake over two inches. 2.20 observed a new river and a little bit more in just about in Deer Valley. They're just under two inches. Sky Harbor is actually our official count here in Phoenix, but they clocked in just under half an inch. As you can see, we're expecting more rain tonight and into your Thursday and possibly Friday. So expect those numbers to really jump up. We're taking a look at our Doppler radar. We're seeing a lot of precipitation in Mesa, Sun Lakes, as well as across the Valley Phoenix. We are a little bit dry right now. This kind of patch of rain we see move and we're expecting rain coverage throughout the rest of the day. We do have some warnings at the moment, but we'll bring you your full forecast and what you can expect this weekend later in the show on Cronkite News. Cronkite News wants to see what your rainy day looks like. Send us your photos and videos of today's storms and you might just see them on TV. Coming up next on Cronkite News at 5, keeping our Arizona vote honest. When we come back, the push to create strong cybersecurity to prevent outside interference in elections. And an Arizona lawmaker looking to toughen up vaping laws. Don't go away. advancements, technologies, and innovations at Arizona State University that are shaping the future for tomorrow and beyond. Catalyst, Wednesdays at 9, right here on Arizona PBS. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. 
We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. More than one organization in Arizona is calling for a fairer and easier election process. Reporter Andrew Christensen found out why the Arizona chapter of the National Council of Jewish Women has teamed up with the Secretary of State Katie Hobbs to ensure that every Arizonan's vote is counted. I attended the Keeping Our Arizona Vote Honest event at Temple Chi where members raised concerns over how outside interference can influence the results of an election. The National Council of Jewish Women Arizona welcomed guest speaker Secretary of State Katie Hobbs. She explained her administration has a close relationship with the FBI, Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center, and the Department of Emergency Management. Their goal? To create a strong cybersecurity to prevent outside interference in elections. Our office hosts monthly security meetings with all 15 counties where we discuss with uh, officials the ways to increase uh, voter security in their areas. And that has led to uh, stronger collaboration between all the IT um, officials. Another issue that was presented, registered Democrats being the only ones who could vote in the primary, which Hobbs says is problematic when it comes to taxpayers' um, money and you know, neglects independent voters. That's not something that we can solve really easily. Um, and independents, especially in Arizona, are just a huge growing group of voters um, that are not organized by a party. And um, so I think we need to take a look at how we conduct that election in Arizona. An issue brought to attention by an audience member making Election Day a holiday, which Hobbs says isn't a bad idea because it raises voters' awareness, but presents a key problem. If you think about holidays right now, Labor Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, who's working on those holidays? Hourly workers, low-wage workers, people that already have a hard time getting to the polls to vote, and those people are going to have to work on Election Day, too. However, some NCJWAZ members believe elections aren't unfair and that the election process is improving. We've had it pretty good. There were some problems, but I think they've worked on it. Uh, 2018 didn't seem to have the problems of 2016. Uh, we had a change in, uh, in our government. Uh, electing uh, Katie Hobbs, which was a big change for us also. Hobbs also discussed the spread of misinformation on social media during elections and encouraged people to spread information from reputable sources. In the Media Center, Andrew Christensen, Cronkite News. Arizona Republican Senator Heather Carter says she'll take another shot at trying to convince the legislature to toughen up on smoking and vaping. She plans to introduce a new bill classifying vaping products as tobacco, limiting use to strictly outdoors. The bill would also raise the buying age of tobacco and vaping products from 18 to 21. Owners of vaping businesses claim that their products help people quit smoking. Two tobacco bills were debated in the last session, but neither was approved. While some lawmakers are looking to be tough on vaping, others are looking to go easy on marijuana, calling the 1970s era war on drugs a failure. A House committee today gave a preliminary approval to a bill that would decriminalize pot nationwide. Heather Cumberledge has a story from our Washington Bureau. The Marijuana Opportunity and Reinvestment Expungement Act would do more than just decriminalize marijuana. It would also erase many pot convictions from the last five decades and award grants to newly legal cannabis businesses. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler, who sponsored the bill, says it is long past time to fix the law. We long believe that the criminalization of marijuana has been a mistake. The racially disparate enforcement of marijuana laws has only compounded this mistake with serious consequences, particularly for minority communities. Nicknamed the Moore Act, the bill is believed to be the most comprehensive marijuana reform legislation to pass a congressional committee. It would remove cannabis from the DEA's list of Schedule I narcotics and expunge marijuana convictions as far back as 1971, when President Nixon started the war on drugs. The bill would also direct investment into those communities that were hit hard by the war on drugs, primarily minority communities. 
Republicans on the committee complained that the bill was being shoved through with little opportunity for debate or amendment. Change, or do you want some more record? And if you want record, you get it. If you want change, then we actually need to have a process in which we actually put everything out, take this bill, and actually talk about it. The bill also includes a tax on cannabis products that would be used to fund job training, prisoner re-entry services, as well as literacy and substance abuse treatment programs. Congressman Ken Buck of Colorado warned that the bill was too big to get through the Senate. He called for it to be scaled back. The nice thing about the Senate is they will do nothing. <laughs> Very efficient, but they will do nothing. And when it comes to a bill like this, they will not address it. I would love to work with the, the chair. I'd love to have my staff work with the Judiciary Committee staff on, on uh, at least moving some parts of this marijuana issue. The bill has 57 co-sponsors, including Arizona Democratic Representatives Raul Grijalva of Tucson and Ruben Gallego of Phoenix. It passed the committee easily on a largely partisan 24 to 10 vote. The Arizona Democrat Greg Stanton voting That's for it and Arizona Republican Debbie Lesko voting against it. Louisiana Democratic Representative Cedric Richmond called it an important first step. Those of us that were in those communities when the failed war on drugs started, we know the damage that was done. And we know that the many collateral consequences that people face because of it. No floor vote has been scheduled, but lawmakers on the committee said they expect the Moore Act will pass the Democrat-controlled House by a largely partisan vote. But it faces a much tougher road in the Senate. In Washington, Heather Cumberlidge, Cronkite News. Now Danielle is here with us on the desk. You know, I think I must have gotten the wrong message this morning. I thought we were supposed to be stoked for this newscast, not soaked. A little soaked, a little bit of rain if you've stepped outside your front door today. I like that. I'm going to use that one. But we are <laughs> stoked about some of the other weather we've got heading into your weekend. We're going to take a look at our Doppler radar, and we are seeing a flash flood warning in Gila and Yavapai counties if you're over there. That flash flood warning is in effect until 545 this evening. We're seeing a lot of rain in that part of Arizona. Looking at our future cast, all of that green you're seeing, that's rain, but by Saturday and Sunday, it's gonna be out of our way, no worry. Thursday and Friday should be some of the heavier rain days if you're joining us from Central Arizona, Phoenix, and all that, all of our viewing areas there. Looking at what you can expect for your Thursday, you're gonna start your morning with a 60% chance of rain, high of 57 degrees around 8 a.m. So if you're getting the kids up and on the school bus, you're gonna to wanna to send them with an umbrella, or a jacket and some rain boots. We're seeing those rain chances pretty high with scattered showers and thunderstorms throughout the day. 40% chance of scattered thunderstorms throughout your day around 12 noon. And we're seeing temperatures dip into the 60s by 6 p.m. 20% chance of rain. What can you expect for the next three days? Thursday, sorry to tell you folks, we're gonna see those continued scattered showers on Thursday. Friday, partly cloudy skies. Saturday for ASU versus Oregon, a high of 69 with partly cloudy skies. Your work week, Monday and Tuesday, a 20% chance of rain. Cloudy skies on Wednesday. Up next, an early Christmas treat for an Arizona family. After the break, we will bring you a story sure to bring you in the holiday spirit. Stick around. Cronkite Noticias is the Spanish-speaking division of Cronkite News, covering topics such as economics, education, sustainability, immigration, and border relations. Cronkite Noticias strives to serve the Spanish-speaking community in Arizona. Under the guidance of prominent Spanish-speaking professionals, students at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism develop content for our broadcast partner, Univision, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Explore Cronkite Noticias at cronkitenoticias.azpbs.org. Then I stumbled across the kids' programs and I fell in love with Arthur. I, mean, I used to be a school teacher. Some of my classes I taught were K through six. I liked Arthur's approach to how you would teach a moral or how to teach a way to react to a situation. And they always had a moral to story. So I s still watch Arthur quite religiously. For more information about including Arizona PBS in your future plans, visit azpbs.org giving. For a family in Arizona, what was supposed to be a dream come true quickly turned to heartbreak. But thanks to the kindness of strangers, the dream they've hoped for ended up becoming something magical. 
The Polar Express is Ty Swannett's favorite book and his favorite movie. So his parents were thrilled to take him to ride the train. But he has autism and got so excited and so overwhelmed, his parents said he had a meltdown. In a Facebook post, Ty's mom says her heart ached for her son. Then the train's conductor came along and gave him, Ty his pocket watch. His mom says even though they didn't get on the train that day, they got something even more magical, the gift of human kindness. And the conductor has since reached out to the family, saying that the Grand Canyon Railway wants them to come back on them so Ty can experience his dream of running the Polar Express. Cronkite News is proud to be the, the proud news sponsor of Arizona Horizon and Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and Arizona PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, we'll continue our coverage and analysis of the House public impeachment inquiry of President Trump. Testimony expected from key witness Gordon Sundland, Trump fundraiser and the ambassador to the European Union. I'm Amna Nawaz. Tonight on the News Hour, the first witnesses who listened to the president's phone call at the center of the impeachment inquiry. That's coming up after Cronkite News and Arizona Horizon on Arizona PBS. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Stay connected with our news teams on Twitter, Facebook, and Cronkite News. Arizona Horizon with Ted Simons is next. You have a great evening. broadcasts a violent world. But we may be living in the most peaceful era in human existence. Can science reduce violence? Here are things that we could do. The Violence Paradox on NOVA. All new tonight at 8 on Arizona PBS. Explore.